Well, hello, folks, and welcome back to my channel. Uh, and uh, welcome to my channel on everything related to uh, mainframe computers, uh, mostly IBM or any kind. Uh, today, we're going to start a new series, or I'm going to start a new series on how to look at those dumps that MBS seems to create at every other turn. Um, and use those dumps uh, as a tool to find what's wrong, what you're doing most of the time, what we're doing wrong um, with uh, MBS when we program, when we do stuff, and to debug uh, and make our and make our programs uh, uh, as free of bugs as possible. Now, I've created a lot of um, some material uh, on how to. Um, how to do uh, dump analysis um, and I have on my github I have this um, repository called Ab uh, Abend Analysis, Abnormal End Analysis and um, there's some material in there. Before we go in there however I would like to say a few things about um, dumps. Uh, one, one of the greatest uh, ideas that the uh, developers of OS 360 had uh, that actually goes back a little bit more than that is to dump memory. Uh, before we understand what dumps is we need to also think a little bit how back in the days uh, mainframe operated. Back in the 60s the newest way for computers to have RAM, the rendered access memory, was to have ferrite core memory. Ferrite core is is a memory made of wires crossing each other in a particular way so that when you read you actually were at the time forced to change the bits um, so that you could read them and then immediately change it back again to what they were and, um, and when you're writing of course you also change into fry core however the good things is it was all about magnetization of those of those wires and um, at the time um, if uh, the memory was magnetized a particular way, you could turn up the computer and turn it on and it was still exactly the same. It's not like RAM today when if you lose, if a computer nowadays loses power for a split second, all the memory content is wiped. Back then, memory uh, was stable. You could turn up the computer for m months or years, turn it on, and it was still, everything, the content of the memory was still there. And in fact, um, a lot of the things that we know today from warm IPL or restarting a computer in a warm way instead of a cold way, uh, you could often restart the computer and it would be, you know, logically the operating system would be still in, in, in the exact same spot as it was before. And the idea of dumps came to dump the memory after a computer crashed. If a computer crashed, you could then restart the computer, run a little dump analysis tool and it would dump everything that was still in memory from the previous crash and very often by doing that you could then find out what was wrong um, uh, with, with, uh, with the program that was running. And so they invented this way to dump the memory and dumping the memory actually still has a lot of validity in the days when uh, mainframe computers nowadays all have RAM modules exactly the same like the ones we have or very similar to the ones we have on our computers. Um, so we're going to uh, just for sake of making clear what a dump is, I've created a program here that dumps and I'm sure you've seen this before, um, just showing you here, I wrote a little assembler program here, um, all it does is open a file, read some stuff from a file and then produce a report uh, on paper. Um, so this is my assembler program. And when you run this assembler program the way that I do, you will always end up with this dump. Okay, so here is a dump. And I'm sure you've seen this before, a lot of hexadecimal numbers, a lot of structures here, and then the address space of the offending program is dumped in hexadecimal and with printable characters anywhere you could find them uh, on the right side. I grew up with this dump. Um, when I started as a programmer in the early 80s, I would dump all the time, I still do, and we had the person in the organization who was the dump guru. Everybody, instead of sitting down and learning dump analysis, 
they just went to him and told him what's wrong with my program. He would take the dump on paper, uh, unfolded uh, striped paper, very similar to the one we have on the screen. Obviously, it would have like holes on the side for the for the tractor, um, and it would sit on it for a couple of minutes. I would tell you you have a problem like this and this and this and there. Um, I did not learn dump analysis back then because every time I went and asked for the manuals, um, the uh, I was in the military back then. The officers who were in charge of the manuals wouldn't just would just wouldn't give them to me. Uh, so I had to go learn dump analysis later. Um, but uh, the dump analysis is not a black, it's not black magic. It's not a occult art. It can be learned very simply. And so this is what this, uh, what this video is about, dump analysis. Now, um, so I have this, this GitHub, um, Moshik's Abend Analysis. Um, I have this GitHub repository where I have um, the JCL and the program to create the dump. Um, I have also conveniently put in the 370 um, uh, card. Every programmer back in those days used to have this card, which is um, a way for us to find the codes for each instruction, 370 instruction, and how it works. Very useful little thing here as well as the dump itself. So how do we get this? Let's get started. I have here, I'm connected to my Linux computer, although I'm doing this on Windows. Um, the way to get this dump is to go here, clone or download, make, you know, put this in your cut and paste buffer and, and then do this. And then it will download my dump Okay, and then we go into dump analysis. First of all, we have the 37 instructions um, PDF. Then this is my dump here as an example. Um, and then we have the um, uh, the job that creates the dump. So this is for MBS 3.8, obviously, for our TK4. Um, and then I have a simple assembly program. What it does is, I'll, I can go line by line, but CSEC, that's the name of the, of the uh, code section here. Uh, then we save all the registers on entry as requested by the architecture. Um, we set up our base register, which is gonna be R12. Um, we ensure we have a safe, a, uh, a safe area chain build so that if we control is removed from us from the operating system, it can pass it back to us. Um, and then I open this file, um, and then um, we create a table We're using, and, and our register nine is the one addressing it. And then we do some um, stuff. Um, we read uh, through the input, uh, we, uh, through the output. Yeah, so the entrants are all here. So we have some names in here. And then we read through this table. And as long as there's entries in the table, we put them all onto here. And this put instruction, which is a macro instruction, we write them to a printer. And uh, when we're done, we close the, f the output file that it we opened in here. And we have an out DCB here, um, which refers to a DD name called out DD. Um, and here is our uh, data sequence. And that's it. So, um, and then we have the sysprint here. We print everything to the printer. And if we run this program, and you run this program on your on your TK4 or whatever MBS 3.8, this will always dump. And I know why, obviously, and I did my dump analysis. But this is a job that will create this dump. You're welcome to do this and run your dump. And so, um, obviously, then 
The real question is why does this job uh, dump? And that's where dump analysis starts. But I would invite everybody to first get as far as getting this job to run so that they can look at the same dump as I do. And so I put together a presentation here that will allow us to learn a little bit more about uh, reading dumps. Um, and uh, this is part one. There may be a part two and part three, depending on how deep we want to go. I will also listen for your uh, feedback, how deep you want to take this. There, there is quite a bit to learn about dump uh, analysis. One more thing I would like to say is that this refers to MBS 3.8 dump formats. Um, the dump format has changed over the years and today it looks quite a bit different. This is a dump that I'm very familiar with from, from the 80s, but um, nowadays on ZOS I know the dumps look, look a little different. However, um, 85 to 90 percent of what we learn here will also still relate to ZOS um, dump analysis as well. Um, so let's get right into it. So what is a dump? Um, a dump is a service provided by the operating system. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's an error recovery procedure. Um, it, it's a printout of the address space of a program that's running, um, a user program that's running, a problem state program that's running on MBS 3.8. Um, uh, as we know, the address space of MBS is built in a particular way. All the nucleus um, of MBS, all the system tables and control uh, structures and area uh, memory areas are actually mapped into each address space of each program so the eight we actually have inside each one of our address space we see all the areas of the operating system we cannot change them unless we have certain um, permissions and um, but um, they are all part of the of the address space um, and so a dump is basically just a photograph of the address space at the moment that, that, that an error uh, occurred. And, and as such, dump, um, a dump is really mainly a, a debugging tool. How do we produce an MVS dump? Well, we have to tell, when we run a job, we have to tell the, uh, the MVS operating system that we want to be able to receive a dump. So we need to put at the very least this line, oops, uh, in, uh, in our job. So as you can see here, CCU dump DD sys out and then wherever you want to send it. Um, and sometimes you need to put in sys a bend for more for a fuller dump um, where you have also further memory areas and the full address space. Usually CCU dump is enough. Um, uh, and if you don't code any of this too in your JCL, MES will produce an indicative dump um, even when no CCU dump is included. So you get some, uh, just a little bit of a dump, even if you uh, don't include those two uh, data definitions here that we see at the bottom of the screen. Um, oops. So how do you know that the program abandoned? Uh, that's the first thing. A lot of people don't even realize that, that they abandoned, they don't just don't see the results. But uh, um, first of all, when the user program abnormally ended, because abend means up ended, abnormally ended, um, you get uh, in the JS2 output stream, you get an indication of that. So here, for instance, in this case, Herc02 started class A on this system, uh, the time it started, and then we see that we're in stop name proc state. Um, um, we're in the in this step here, and we have a return code of eight. Um, and then we start to have here some error code. Error, user program is abnormally terminated um, in the go step and we get a code S0C7. Uh, so 0C7 is the abend reason. That's why the, the program abandoned very soon after it started. And, and so in this, in this case, 0C7 is the cause for the abend. And so of course the program is ended but uh, here is, is a very strong indication that something's very wrong. And 0C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, etc., those are all related to invalid instructions. And, and so now we need to go find out why this happened. Um, uh, 
Now, a few things here about, about the S370 architecture. First of all, the System 370, we need to know, has variable length instruction codes. Uh, not all architecture, architectures have variable length instruction codes, which means that some instructions uh, take two bytes, some take four, some take six, etc., etc. And the only way to understand those instructions, because when, an, when a program abends, it abandoned not because of a COBOL instruction, not because of a PL1 instruction, it, it, it abandoned because a, a, an assembler instruction, a machine instruction generated either by an assembler or by a compiler uh, uh, was, was, was illegal uh, or something illegal was attempted. So it's not really, you know, uh, events don't really happen at the COBOL Fortran source code level, they happen at the machine code level. And, um, and so therefore, we really need to have an understanding of the 70, S370 and beyond uh, architecture. I put in a reference card in the GitHub repository that you hopefully download. Um, and there, every machine instruction of the S370 architecture is documented. Um, so always, because we have variable instruction length, always account for the instruction length count, which is uh, documented in the, in the dump. So, uh, what we're going to do here now is start looking at the dump that was generated, which is the one that you have in the GitHub repository, and start understanding what's wrong. And so, what I did here is every field of the dump, I gave it a meaningful field of the dump that we need for debugging. I put in here, I put in a legend here, and then we'll go in the legend and understand what this all is. Now, obviously, you know, a lot of this is self-explanatory. Um, like you know, A, what is it's the job name, B is which step, which is actually probably more important than the job name because most people know the job name, but where in which step uh, we had a problem here was in the go step, so not in the compilation. Obviously, compilers and the samples very, very rarely abend because they have been properly debugged, the time, the date. And then there is about 30 to 40 pages usually in a dump. This, you know, there's obviously been um, page number one. This is uh, a very important uh, code here on this page, which is the completion code. Why this program abandoned, why this program dumped. And 0C7 uh, is something that we'll look into it later, but usually all the 0C ones are uh, illegal instructions. And then uh, right at the beginning of the dump, we'll see uh, the program status word at the entry to the event. So when the event occurred, when when illegal instruction execution was attempted, and we have to see, you know, we'll see what 0C7 in particular means, but uh, this is what the program status word was. And G will point to the to the instruction in the address space that caused this um, this uh, this event. However, we always have to consider that you know that the instruction length of the instruction cost was four bytes long. So when we go look at that, we will have to go back four bytes. Um, but uh, before we go into you know all this reading everything that's in the dump and understanding what this all means, uh, we need to understand how a little bit of how MBS works. And for that, we need to understand that, you know, there is a lot of control blocks inside the kernel of the MBS nucleus that the dump will refer to. And I have here this little uh, scheme here. Let me see if I can zoom in. Uh, is it possible to zoom in? Nope, doesn't seem to be possible. Sorry about this, guys. I'm not so good with Windows, or as I like to say, I'm not very premium with Windows, but uh, this just shows um, just some of the most important control blocks that MBS uses to run everything. Um, for us programmers, uh, we can have access to most of this and we can read what's going on with most of this. Some of those will relate with processes, a lot of this will relate with paging and, and virtual memory. Some will uh, relate to 
the real memory, RAM management. Some will relate to devices and files, um, but a little bit of an understanding of this is required. And there is some excellent manuals on this, mostly on Beat Sabers. And if you go back to um, MBT and even um, MFT uh, Beat Sabers documents, they will document a lot of this. And this, some of this have changed a little bit, uh, but not a lot. And even today in uh, ZOS, you still, you know, the entry table where you can have access to most of these other control uh, blocks and control areas is always through the uh, CBT. Um, TCB is the task control block, obviously, uh, which refers to the task being executed. Um, and, and, you know, from starting from CBT, you can start then, uh, you know, attaching yourself to other tables and from there get addresses of other tables until you get what, what it is you exactly need. And in the dump, a lot of these areas are going to be represented because in, a, in, a, in an address space that is executing just before it dumps, just before it uh, bends, uh, most of these uh, control areas are somewhere there in the address space. And reading those and understanding uh, what is the status of each one of those table, uh, tables is important to debugging a program. Uh, it's not important, we're not gonna go through all the tables in here. Um, this is just to show you that there is a lot of control blocks, obviously, and way more than the ones we see here, of course. Uh, these are just the ones that are useful for debugging. Um, but it is somewhat important to understand all that. It's beyond the scope of this video to, to explain each and one of those, but uh, for the, pur the purpose of debugging our program, I will mention some of these tables and you're welcome to stop the video, go back and try to locate the tables that I will be mentioning. Um, and maybe I will also refer back to this table as I create this video, uh, just for you to know. So um, here we see just one of them, TCB, the task control block. Um, we'll see in a moment why that is important, but um, you know, this is as far as I want to take it today. I want to give you some link links before this below this video, so you can start reading some of the control blocks. I will also upload uh, this graph that I just showed, um, so you can uh, refer, maybe print it out and refer to it. If you also want to print out the dump that I put in my GitHub, um, so that you can um, uh, the one that it's in here. It's called Broad Herc Zero One. Um, maybe print it out so you can also go through it. Um, so this is the first part of the dump analysis video. I know I want to take it much further than, than here because there's a lot of material we have to cover. Uh, I'll stop here and give you some time to set, get set up, we'll download the GitHub repository, print out stuff, and then we'll continue with part two uh, in a few days. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
Thank you.